everyone is pointless. <laughs> we saw you guys, we were all touchy-feely, thank you. This time, no. <laughs> nope. This time, it's all about Jason Andrew Narvi, Ph.D. Yeah. <laughs> what is who knows the Ph.D.? This guy right here. <laughs> that, that's opposing degrees. <laughs>
You got craft service, your dressing room, this set. From here to here, you have a guy who goes to your dressing room. Mr. Narby, could you go to set? And they walk you to a airtight door. That's sort of like a space lock for uh, astronauts. You go through that door, your head pops. So you go through the door, in the doorway is some poor PA with a walkie-talkie who sits there for 12 or 13 hours all day just saying, Mr. Narvi has gone through door number one. He'll be going through the second door in a second. How you doing, Jim? Oh, fine, Mr. Narvi. Could you, could you, could you please go through the door? They're waiting on you. They're waiting on you. Where's Narvi? He went through the door five seconds ago. He's on his way. Uh, Mr. Narvi, they're, they're, they're waiting for you. I, I need this job. Please don't. I really would like you to set it. Ah! Okay, okay. And then you walk through the door. Okay, I'm on my way to set now. I'm a big boy. I know how to find it. Oh, son of a bitch. It's another PA. All right, Mr. Narvi, can we get you to set now? You're running a little bit behind. I know you had some problems going through the airlock doors. Everything coming all right? right. We'll have to get you through. All right, let's we'll walk you all the way through. The reason there's a person to meet you at that second airtight door is to make sure you do not deviate and go over to craft service. Even though that craft service is there for you to feast on throughout the day and you're salivating like a dog that wants to eat just fucking something before you go to the damn set again because you're up since 4.30 in the freaking morning and that's time to freaking eat because your stomach is already churning when you're up at 4.30 in the morning, yet they will walk you right past it. Sorry, Mr. Sorry, you can go to craft service a little bit later. We'll call somebody on the set and they will take you to the front door of the set, the fake set. You're at the flats and you're about to walk on a set and yet they hand you off to another poor PA who will take you to the set and stand you in front of the assistant director who yell at your face and ask you where the fuck you are. That's what it's like. And a director that can't make up his mind because he's an artist. That's what it's like to be an actor in Hollywood in the modern era. Nah, I still say you don't have to practice to be good at something. A oh, big skill here, for instance. He's never practiced anything in his life. Hey, kid, give me a roll. Let's go. Show the kid what you got. I'm waiting, Skull. <laughs> then I think Power Rangers was my first real gig. I mean, I think I did one or two little stupid things, but it was my first one. I was, it was, um, what, six months out of high school? Seven months, something like that? I mean, I got the gig. Um, I auditioned in September. I had graduated in June. Um, and then I actually got, I got put on file. I didn't get the original callback uh, for the pilot. You know how that works, right? You do the pilot, you cast it, you film it, you sell it. Then you probably re reshoot the pilot. People always call the first episode the pilot. That's not true. The pilot is sometimes shot way before, recast and all that stuff. So they recast the pilot. And they, they switch the roles of the main character, uh, of the main bad guys. Um, in the original pilot, um, there was no bulk and skull. There was bullies one, two, and three. Okay, and they shot it in a uh, in a bowling alley in Santa Monica. Um, and really, the whole purpose of the bullies was to show that the Power Rangers could kick ass in high school as well as intergalactically. I mean, parents today would probably shriek, you know, knowing that we're teaching kids, no, you gotta beat up kids at school to be a hero too. Um, but they were real punks. I mean, I, maybe they weren't called bully, they were called punks one, two, and three. Um, and the main punk was this guy named Bobby, okay? Paul Schreier, who later played Bulk, was punk number two. Punk number two later became Skull, punk number one became Bulk, and here's why. Is, Bobby was actually a scary, intimidating guy. He was, I, I think he was like six foot two or something like that, I'm not really sure. And he had like a lazy eye, and he was like really intimidating. And they wanted it to be really violent. The original one was really violent, much like the Japanese version. Um, Japanese version really has stuff like the Green Ranger either kills his parents or their parents were killed, yeah. And they actually have a, uh, one episode where the Power Rangers are um, crucified, yeah. Yeah, they really crucified him. I don't know if it was real crucifixion or if they just nailed him to a stake. I don't know if they did the whole Jesus thing, but they crucified him. Um, so you couldn't do that kind of violence. When they sold it to Fox, Fox was like, oh, that's cute, now you gotta tone down the violence. But they still wanted this aspect that the Power Rangers were tough at school as well as intergalactically. So they wanted to keep Bulk and Skull. Oh, they wanted to keep the bullies. So they decided to make them comic bullies. And they were, they were only in like two or three episodes, or maybe three or four. Um, 
Ernie, you know, the big fat guy who ran the juice bar, uh, Richard Ginelli was supposed to be the comic relief. And so were the Power Rangers, actually. The Power Rangers would do stupid stuff like they morph and they land in the command center and they fall on each other. Ooh, oh, isn't that hilarious? The way all these good looking people try to be funny. It wasn't funny. Um, but once they decided to make them comic bullies, Paul was a better actor than Bobby. Sorry, Bobby. But Sorry, Bobby. That's the truth. Paulie was theater trained. He really was. Um, and he knew slapstick. Um, so Paul became the leader, and Bobby became the sidekick. Well, Bobby was no sidekick. I mean, the guy, the guy was, you know, like I said, <laughs> you know, he couldn't do the sidekick stuff. He couldn't do the shtick. So about, what was it, three days? It the week before they were going to start principal photography, they're like, we got to get rid of this guy. So they pulled from the file of people that had previously auditioned. I had auditioned for Billy, actually. Um, I didn't even know it at the time, but that's what I auditioned for. Um, uh, little did I know they wanted good-looking guys for the nerd. <laughs> and I was, I was sexy, not good-looking. So anyway, um, <laughs> uh, so they, they literally, I, I kid you not, you want to talk about luck and you better, 50% luck, 50% being prepared for it. I, I kid you not. People say, it was because you were good? No. Was it because you were lucky? No. What they did was they went through and they pulled like 10 headshots of people that had previously auditioned that were on file that looked like they could basically do it. Um, I happened to be one of the ones that my, whose face fell under their fingertips. There you go. And I showed up. I went right from work, and I was working at a Ford dealership at the time, uh, to the audition. I was in a bad mood. I was in my leather jacket. I was already greasy from work. So when they wanted someone that was going to be obnoxious, there I was. And I was a punk. I was literally a punker. So there I was with this freaking attitude showing up, and they didn't really have a really good script. They're like, can you impro improvise for us or whatever? So I improv my way through the thing. Um, and I said, they're going to remember me whether they like me or not. One of the first episodes I ever shot, it was, there was a scene with me and um, Tui Trang and I think AJ was in it. But I like try to like hit on Tui and like there's a giant Sunday and like I put my hand against the bar and she smacks it out and I fall face first into it. First scene I ever shot, actually. And here's the funny thing. I didn't realize that if a camera is not looking at you but the person next to you, it can't see you. So I was off camera diving into the, into the damn giant Sunday. Wardrobe hated me for my first day on the set. It was awesome. So. <laughs> oh, how good to see you, nice lady. We just returned from the opera, you know. Yes, but uh, the opera. <laughs> A gift for our lovely teacher. <laughs> it's nice to see you boys uh, taking this assignment so seriously. Now, why don't you be gentlemen and open this for me? I've just had my nails done. Uh, but we would not want to deprive you of the pleasure. <laughs> Come on, you guys. Don't quit now. <laughs> Shut up, dweeb. <laughs> Please. I insist. the movie we didn't actually jump out of we didn't do the skydiving stuff what we did was um, it was like we shot it like four in the morning three in the morning it was horrible and they had they of course they had a fake plane that was about uh, fifth, 10 to 15 feet off the ground and we jumped out of that you know at four in the morning it may as well have been a plane and then what they did was because having us do the stunts was considered too dangerous because they don't want to throw us out of a plane over the outback so what they did was <laughs> they thought this was much safer is they hooked me to Polly, you know 300 pound Polly and a little old me dangling from him you know and they put us on a crane over a rock quarry uh, it was a what rock quarry. It was a pit. They were building a skyscraper, and it was the pits 
underneath uh, the, 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 the skyscraper, the, the actual uh, parking lot, you know, 10 stories below ground. So they put us on the thing, they hang me from Polly, and then they pull us up 100 feet above the ground, which would put us about probably two or three hundred feet above the damn pit, and dangled us and then let us parachute down off the crane. Horrible. Freaking horrible. So we got even with them because they were doing night shoots for about a month and a half. And so what, what happened was we'd have the night off and they would shoot from 6 p.m. till 6 a.m. And so what Paulie and I would do is we'd go to the bars in the local neighborhood because uh, it was our night off and we would be, we'd go and get drunk and show up on the set while they're all in the middle of their work. You're like, hey guys, how you doing? Did you remember the time you put us up on the crane about 300 feet? <laughs> I'm going to have another drink. That's, that's, that's what we did. <laughs> yeah, we showed up drunk on that set a lot. Not during the work day. I mean, like, never during the work day, seriously, but we had a lot of time on our hands. Well, I quit the show to go to college. Um, I was finding that, um, uh, uh, I don't want to say I was becoming a bit of a Hollywood asshole, but I kind of was. I definitely was becoming a prick, and I lost, I, 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 I lost track of who I was and where I was going. I found that I was no longer trying to think, you know, I, I, I was no longer trying to find ways to improve on my art. I found that often I was trying to escape from it. I wanted to escape from it. It was, I was not making me happy. It was not, I had accomplished at the age of, uh, you know, 20, no, shit, I was 18. At the age of 18, I accomplished what I thought it was gonna take me, you know, until I was 35 to do. I really thought it was gonna take me until I was 30 to be a working actor, at least. I really did, um, because that's the way it usually is, guys. Sorry, 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 sorry. But that's the truth, you gotta work your way up to it. So I accomplished it too early. So I'm like, now what? So I tried to get away from it, and, and I, I quit the show to go to college. I tried to go to college and do the show at the same time, but our shooting schedule wouldn't allow for it. So I'm like, see ya. In fact, I'm not even gonna go to school in Los Angeles, so you can't call me. I'm going to school as far away as I can, and I, I went and hit up in Amish country. So I went to college. Um, in Pennsylvania, Franklin and Marshall uh, graduated, what, 2002? Uh, and while I was there, um, I, I was trying to be a history major. I, I told you I wanted to avoid this fucking acting stuff as much as I could. I really did. Um, so I ended up deciding, though, that higher ed was a noble calling. <laughs> what a sucker. But no, I really thought it was a noble calling. I thought it was awesome, you know? And I was, I was shocked and... Uh, um, inspired by working with younger uh, people who they were, had no aspirations to be famous, but they really were serious about their art. It was great. And I said, this is something worth dedicating your life to. So when I graduated, though, I mean, I still did a couple episodes of Power Rangers here and there. Go on! Hey, thanks for taking care of Spike, Bulky. Mm -hmm. You'll come visit, right? I'd love to catch up. I would love to. Great! <laughs> Ah, well, I hate to say it, but uh, it's time to go. You go. <laughs> um, my first job when I graduated was doing um, uh, doing regional theater. You know, immediately as, I, as soon as I graduated, I had a job waiting for me doing Mercutio and Romeo and Juliet somewhere up upstate Pennsylvania. Um, so I did that. I started a theater company in New York. Um, we did a lot of theater on the Lower East Side. Um, kind of the whole fringe scene that was popping up at that point, you know, did the fringe fests and all that stuff. Um, then uh, went to grad school, uh, did my master's in Shakespeare in, you know, early, what the hell's my actual, er, wait, Renaissance Literature and Performance or whatever. Shakespeare and Literature, Shakespeare Renaissance Literature and Performance. So I uh, did that at the American Shakespeare Center, which was called Shenandoah Shakespeare at the time. Um, did that for a couple of years. We got my PhD in Santa Barbara, California, UC Santa Barbara, and blah, 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 blah. So I can be a college professor. That's the long and short of it. Very short version. You know, theater is great. You, you know, it's, you know, uh, your first uh, full-time theater gig where you're, you know, rehearsing for eight hours a day is great. It's, but it's tiring. You know, it's very tiring to be on your feet for eight hours a day. <laughs> You know, but it's great to, to explore a piece for eight hours. What, what actually sucks is when you actually get into run-throughs, to run the same show again and 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 do them at the matinees. It's hard to keep it fresh. You really understand why Stanislavski identified what they call the actor's problem, which is to deliver an inspired performance again and again and again. 
in theory, you shouldn't be changing it. Once it's been set, once you've done all the exploring, the piece shouldn't change much. It'll grow in the direction it's been spun off in, but you can't really change it. So in theory, you're doing the same thing again and again. That's why you always have to find something interesting that you know will let it grow. I can't say I ever gave the same performance twice. <laughs> God help me, I hope I never did. Um, but you can only deviate so much, you know. There is room for wiggle. And some directors will encourage it. Not all, but some. And there's a lot of things about my job that I, that I go, oh man, I gotta do that tomorrow. Um, and even if I'm in a bad mood, I usually walk out of the classroom in a much better room. Uh, I love seeing uh, young people grow. Uh, become empowered. That to me is the thing. It's not a, just about learning. Anybody can learn, but I, but I think th the job of a college professor is to help their students who are fully formed human beings when they start college. Okay, They are adults and it's helping them assert themselves in the world. That to me is what a college professor is supposed to do, okay? Uh, and so to me, to see my students become empowered and start taking the reins um, and then grow, that to me is, is really the most rewarding thing, I think. Number one, be patient. <laughs> um, it doesn't happen overnight, and if you expect it to, you're in the wrong business. Um, two, non est pecunia. Latin phrase, meaning it ain't the money. It's not about the money. You uh, don't do anything in this world for the money. You know, um, you're not necessarily be going to become rich. Forget about fame. Those are byproducts. Love what you do. Um, believe in what you do. Believe that what you do has a higher purpose, and then be the best you possibly can be at that particular trade. You know, um, so that you can always slap yourself on the chest and say. I've got a trade. I think a lot of people go in it because it seems glitzy and glamorous. Um, and as you know, as a film student, I hope, it's a lot of hard work, a lot of thankless work. You know, there better be a reason for it. You know, if it's because you think you're going to win the lottery of jobs, it's called gambling. That's a different occupation. A good one. I'm not saying anything against gamblers. I mean, it's a good occupation, but this one is not, uh, it's not consistent, if you know what I mean. Let me tell you about Jason Narvey, the man, the legend. Who cooler than Jason Narvey? The, the bully in Power Rangers. But besides from that, he's actually a really good professor, and he's He's very close with his students, and he forms a relationship like he's your buddy. And he, if he's so proud of us, he does abuse us, but that's okay. He will hit you if you do good. Um, he's very he's very open, and you can come to him about anything. You can talk to him about anything, and he's just overall a really good man. Jason Arby, the legend. So. Jason Narvey is not the kind of person who will, you know, hug you, pat you on the back if you do a good job. No, he actually beats the crap out of you if you do a good job. Um, and it pushes you. It really, truly does push you to do better things and to keep moving on and evolving in what it is that you do. Sometimes it leaves bruises, but that's okay. We, we hide those under loose clothing, and that typically leaves things fine. Um, as a teacher, he's, he's very, very adept and he definitely knows what he's doing. As a person, he owes me some money. If, if, um, if y'all can help me out here, I'm gonna try and um, get his signature sold on eBay for $20. I think I get $20 for it, maybe 25. So if y'all could just, I don't know, send some forms his way, get some signatures, 70-30. We can do it. Do I like Jason Narvey? How does one put Jason Narvey into words? Jason Narvey is a man? No. Jason Narvey is the man. The man! He built the Eiffel Tower out of brawn and steel. He's a god among us students here. He's personable. 
He shows his love in many ways, such as a swift punch to the face or arm, a kick to the groin. This is Jason Narvi, the god among men of theater. <laughs> All right. Go, go. All right, you are. All right, go, go, go. Ah, no, it's ripping. Wow, you suck at this. Have you ever done this before? Ah, ah. It didn't work. I quit on you. Go, go. Uh, wait. What? It's not going anywhere. Just keep going. Just get it. You should, I told you to get two ply. <laughs> Can you hold this? Oh, sure, by all means. What would you like me to hold it for? <laughs> okay, now go. Okay, thank you, Jason. You're, you're such a good sport. Now you're going the wrong right way. I'm going. Oh, nah. Okay. Wait, wait. I have stay. a PhD. <laughs> this is why he's our favorite. Wait, wait. Uh, 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 there we go. Wait, get the arm. Get there the we go. There we go. Oh. Alienation in dramas. Concordia needs The American West. Wait, okay. Let's just. Wait. It's, you thank can, you. Concordia needs better. You right the difference between tetrameter and pentameter. <laughs> Paper. This recycled crap doesn't work. <laughs> I hate you, Nicole. You're failing all my classes. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be the very funny.